All right. You weren't so, kidding. Uh, our speaker today is Michael Hall. Uh, he uh, received his PhD from uh, Vanderbilt University just this past uh, spring. And he's just One before that. Pardon? Spring before that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. This is, yeah, this is the spring of 2015. Yes. Right? And he's now a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And today he's going to tell us something about asymmetric electrocardiogram groups and small population quotes. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thanks to Ilya for inviting me. <coughs> um, so I'm going to start by uh, first defining this class of acylindrically hyperbolic groups, um, and then hopefully trying to convince you that this is an interesting class of groups and that we can say some nice things about it. So first of all, um, we're going to start with a group G acting on some metric space XD, and this action uh, is called, this is a, our first definition. This action uh, is acylindrical. This is an action by some metric space. Yes. So my actions on metric spaces are always going to be a group acting by isometries. Um, this acylindrical condition is something of a, a weak form of properness. So for all epsilon, say, bigger than or equal to zero, there exist two constants, R and N, and these constants satisfy if I take two points, X and Y. And let me maybe draw a picture of what's happening here. So my two points are X and Y. So I first require that these points are far away. The distance between them is bigger than or equal to R. And then for any such points, I look at the group elements, which, uh, so I look at the ball of radius epsilon, and I look at group elements, which move both of these points inside those balls. Right, so it, one way to phrase a group being uh, metrically proper is if I said the, the set of G that does this for a single X is finite. Right, so this is kind of a weak form of properness, and I say the set of G that do this for two elements uh, far away is finite. So I'm going to say the set. And finite in the form of finite. Yeah, so, so actually uniformly finite. So the set of G of group elements, which take um, X to within epsilon of itself and Y to within epsilon of itself. Uh, this set has at most n elements. Okay, so once I, I fix uh, epsilon, then I say points that are far away, there's a uniform bound on how many group elements move both of them close to where they started. All right. Um, so a few things we want to note about this. First of all, um, I said this is sort of like a weak form of properness, although technically properness does not imply um, acylindrical, and that's because of this uniformity on the bound, right? So you can have a proper action where this is finite for a single x, but not uniformly finite. As you move from different x's, it gets bigger and bigger. Um, however, if you have an action that's both proper and co-bounded, so there's some bounded set whose translates cover the whole space, um, this will imply acylindrical. Okay. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that if I take any group and act on a single point or any other bounded set, uh, this will be acylindrical because this condition becomes vacuous. Right? I choose my R to be bigger than the diameter of my set, and there are no two points that are that far away. So we'll, we'll need an extra condition to rule this out. Um, and the one thing I'll mention, which I don't want to, I think, give this definition, but just if there are any specialists in the room or people who are familiar with this, um, every acylindrical action satisfies the uh, best Vina Fujiwara WPD condition. So a acylindrical actions are weakly properly discontinuous in the sense of best Vina Fujiwara. Um, <coughs> So I won't, I'll, I'll mention this a few times, but I won't actually define it. But, uh, but this is, is really uh, very 
very similar to this, um, with some more restrictions on the points x and y. Okay, so now the class of groups that I'm going to talk about are um, groups which have these actions on hyperbolic metric spaces. So G is acylindrically hyperbolic. If G admits uh, a, I'll explain some of the terms in this definition in a minute, non-elementary uh, acylindrical action on a hyperbolic metric space. So let me first I guess give some uh, um, attributes, attribute, some attribute who these definitions are too. So this form of, of uh, an acylindrical action, this definition was first stated by Bowditch. Um, and then uh, this definition of an acylindrical hyperbolic group is from uh, Osen. All right, so first of all, let me say uh, we have a hyperbolic metric space. So if you're not familiar with that, what, what that means is that if you take any three points in this metric space and draw the triangle between them, uh, these triangles are sort of uniformly thin. So uh, yeah, well, we, I think we can assume all our metric spaces are geodesic. I don't think it'll matter. Um, for the definition, I don't think it matters, but well, for, the for, for this picture, yeah, it does matter, right? All right. So the, the point is that if I take uh, if I take any point on one side of the triangle, there's a point on one of the other two sides that's at most delta length, and delta is some uniform constant that's independent of the three points I chose. All right. So we have this kind of group acting on this type of metric space. I should also say the non-elementary condition. Um, I'll give a, another uh, way to describe this for acylindrical actions, but in general, for a non-elementary condition on a, uh, of a group action on a metric space, it means that the limit set of the group has at least three points on the boundary. So if you take the uh, point in the space and you look at the G orbit, there should be at least three limit points on the boundary that you, you see as accumulation points of that orbit. Um, and, and that can be simplified a little bit if you're not familiar with those notions, and we'll say that in a minute. So we have a class of groups. So the first question is, uh, are there any interesting groups that admit such actions? All right, so let's start with some examples. So the first example um, is going to be hyperbolic groups, really non-elementary hyperbolic groups. All right, so these were defined by Gromov in the 80s and have been um, kind of a central part of geometric group theory ever since. Um, and if you have such a group G, then the defining property of this group is that its Cayley graph with a finite generating set is hyperbolic. Right? And as I mentioned, this action is, of course, proper and co-bounded. So this is an acylindrical action on a hyperbolic metric space. Right? Um, two. Um, so a lot of the machinery that has been built for hyperbolic groups um, has also been generalized to what's called relatively hyperbolic groups. And these also are going to fall into this class. So we'll say relatively hyperbolic groups, although that's a little bit of an abuse of notation. Because really what you have to say is hyperbolic relative to something specific. All right, so this is, is you have a group with a specified subgroup that you're hyperbolic relative to. And uh, you can form what's called the relative Cayley graph. So if H is your parabolic subgroup, or a collection of parabolic subgroups, if you like, then you take a finite generating set together with that subgroup, and you get what's called a relative Cayley graph, which is a hyperbolic metric space. And the action of the group on this will be acylindrical. Right? And that's, um, I think, stating it in that form is also was proved by Osen. 
Um, the third example I want to give, which is was a motivating example of Bowditch for where he gave this definition, it's the mapping class group of a surface of genus G uh, with P punctures. Um, well, for all but finitely many of these, so we need what uh, three G plus four plus P bigger than four, I think, to rule out the exceptional cases. Um, and the action of this on the curve complex is asylindrical. So Mazur and Minsky proved that the curve complex is a hyperbolic metric space, and then Bowditch proved that this is an asylindrical action. Um, fourth is out Fn uh, for n, I guess, at least two. Uh, and this has an action on what's called the free factor complex. Which is intended to be built as some kind of analog of this curve complex. Um, and uh, this is hyperbolic by work of um, uh, Besvina and Fain. And the action here, I, I think, is not quite, doesn't quite fit this definition of acylindricity. At least I'm not sure. It's not known. It's not known? OK. Yeah, right. So it satisfies this condition that I haven't given you, which turns out to be sufficient uh, to so prove basically why there exists another kind of space on the beginning. Right. So this plus a little bit of work, you can get an actual isolated question. Yes. So there's no um, in this definition. There's no assumption of any kind of faithfulness on the part of this action. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. So like any group that has a quotient as a non-elementary hyperbolic group. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, well, that, that's not true. Uh, we, oh, I so think it's because of the, the, you know, the, the entire kernel will settle. Well, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So you can you can have kernels, but not. They have to be small. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, um, as I mentioned, there's this this weak form of acylindricity called WPD. So this defines a different type of action, but it turns out if I make this definition and I replace acylindrical with WPD, I get the same class of groups. So groups which have these WPD actions also have um, acylindrical actions, and that's a non-trivial combination of a few different theorems. Um, but that's true. So I think for the free factor complex, the only thing that is known is that when epsilon is equal to zero, it's equal to zero. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, the incident. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's in. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so let's see what else. So um, we've also got uh, cat zero groups with, of course, not all of them, but cat zero groups with rank one elements. So. Uh, any right-angled Artin group that doesn't split as a direct product is going to be in here. So um, in decomposable, I guess I mean directly. Uh, in decomposable. Uh, right-angled Artin groups. And this is a condition that you can see from the defining graph of a right-angled Artin group. Either it, it is a join of two subgraphs, in which case it splits, or it's not. Um, and from these groups, um, this was a work of Sisto, is that you can uh, use these rank one elements to build the um, Besvina, Bromberg, Fujiwara projection complex. Which is again a hyperbolic metric space, uh, which is it's not quite going to be an acylindrical action, but it's enough of an action on a hyperbolic metric space that you can um, work through some other equivalent notions that define the same class of groups. Um, so there are other examples, but maybe I'll stop here. Uh, so subgroups. Almost. So well, I, I'm, I'm going to say this in a second. Elementary. Yes. Uh, okay. Right. Exactly. So, so they're either elementary in some sense or acylindrically hyperbolic. Um, so I'll, I'll mention, make this a little more precise in a second. 
Um, I'll just say one more example, which I won't write because it won't fit. Um, but if you have the, the other a natural class of groups acting on, met on hyperbolic metric spaces are um, <coughs> groups that split as amalgamated products or HNN extensions act on vast hair trees. So there's a, a paper of Osten and Mianison where they analyze what you need to act on the vast hair tree to guarantee, you know, I think they use the WPD condition. Um, <laughs> But they get, for example, one, all one relator groups that have at least three generators are always acylindrically hyperbolic. Um, and they get a lot of three manifold groups um, and, and some other interesting examples. Um, so this is, is a fairly large class of groups. Um, so hopefully uh, most of the things on the board that I've written are, have been studied quite a bit um, recently especially. And the idea of, of defining this is that all of these groups, you can get useful information from these actions that I've listed. And the point is, is to try to find a uniform approach to understand all of these groups at once just by having these nice conditions on, on groups that act on hyperbolic spaces in some way. So let me mention uh, maybe a few non-examples and say something about what, what Ilya brought up. So um, if you have a group acting on a hyperbolic metric space, and you have an element here. Uh, this is called loxodromic. Um, if the limit as n goes to infinity, uh, I take some point in the space uh, x, and I translate it by g to the n and I divide that by n, if I get something positive, uh, what that means is that this is an element that acts on my space x with some bi-infinite quasi-geodesic axis, and my element translates points along this axis. Um, so these elements are called loxodromic. Um, if I have a loxodromic element, it has these two unique uh, fixed points on the boundary of x, which I'll call g sub minus infinity and g sub plus infinity. And if I have another loxodromic element, say h, uh, then g and h are called uh, independent if these limit points in the boundary are all distinct. Right? So if g to the plus or minus infinity intersect with h to the plus or minus infinity, is empty, then G and H are called independent. Right, so with this notion, uh, I can give you a theorem of Osen, which classifies uh, acylindrical actions on hyperbolic spaces in the spirit of, of Gromov's classification of actions on hyperbolic spaces. So let G um, act acylindrically on x. So we'll say this is an acylindrical action and x is hyperbolic. Um, then either uh, exactly one of the following three cases happens. One is that g is elliptic. So here I mean uh, bounded orbits. Right, so any group can act um, on a point, right? And this is acylindrical, so you can't rule this out. Um, and these can occur as, as subgroups. You can get arbitrary things like this. Um, G contains a loxodromic element and G is virtually cyclic. So that loxodromic element is just finite index subgroup. The subgroup it generates is finite index in the whole thing. Or the third condition is that G has uh, infinitely many uh, pairwise independent loxodromic elements. All 
right? So these first two would be considered elementary actions, right? And the last one would be non-elementary. So as, as Ilya mentioned, if G acts acylindrically on a hyperbolic metric space, every subgroup also acts acylindrically because this condition is, is trivially satisfying. So if you have a subgroup of an acylindric hyperbolic group, either it's elliptic with respect to that action, it's virtually cyclic, or it's also acylindrically hyperbolic, or the action itself is, um, is non-elementary. So in fact, you can also add up here non-elementary subgroups of hyperbolic groups. Right? They may not be themselves hyperbolic, but they still have a nice enough action on a hyperbolic metric space um, that you can say some things. Um, and this also now um, allows us to, to get some fairly easy properties of these groups, which will allow us to list a few non-examples. So maybe I'll list some non-examples here. So the first thing that you can note is that as soon as you have two independent loxodromic elements, you can play ping pong. Right? So this is a classical argument in geometric group theory that says when you have two elements that uh, act on a space in this way, then some high powers of the two are going to generate a free subgroup. Right? So some properties here is that you're going to have free subgroups. All right, so this rules out amenable groups, um, any group that doesn't have free subgroups. Uh, torsion groups. And by free subgroups, you mean free subgroups uh, of free subgroups? Yes. Non abelian free subgroups. Yes. Um, groups that satisfy a law, um, anything that, that does not contain free subgroups. Um, one thing that you can also get from this is that if you have an infinite normal subgroup, or more generally any subgroup that satisfies um, it that it has infinite intersection with all of its cosets, with all of its uh, conjugates. So if I have a subgroup like this, then um, H is a cylindrically hyperbolic. Okay, and the way that to see this is that, um, well, the way to see that H can't be elliptic is. Yeah. Is it G hyperbolic? Yes. Okay. Yes. So G here is. Uh, so if H is in G, uh, and H is a subgroup. So acylindrical hyperbolic groups are closed with respect to taking infinite normal subgroups. Right, and the point is, if I have, um, say, a point x, and the entire orbit is contained in some ball around that, I can translate x really far away by some element g. Right, and then I'm going to get the entire h orbit is going to be, or the entire h to the I think g inverse orbit is going to be contained in the same ball over here. Right, so by acylindricity, uh, this intersection should be finite. All right, so that says it can't be elliptic. You can also, a um, little bit of work show it can't be virtually cyclic. And you get that these subgroups have to be um, themselves acylindric hyperbolic. So this rules out any groups that have uh, infinite amenable normal subgroups. So for example, groups that have infinite center. All right. This also rules out bomb slog solitar groups. All right, so these are groups with a presentation of the form AT and A to the N equals, uh, or A to the N conjugated by T equals A to the M. And the point here is that A is now going to satisfy this condition. A is going to have infinite intersection with all of its conjugates. Right? But subgroup generated by A is cyclic, so it's not asymmetrically hyperbolic. Okay. Um, we can also get from this that um, G can't split as a direct product of two infinite groups. All 
right? Because if you split as a direct product of two infinite groups, they're both themselves acylindrically hyperbolic. So you could find a loxodromic element here and a loxodromic element here that were independent, and then they would generate a free subgroup, right? But obviously something from here and something from here can't generate a free subgroup. Okay, so this gives some um, non-trivial restrictions on what these groups can be. Um, one thing I should mention is that these are all sort of uh, global conditions. So all of these groups can embed into acylindrically hyperbolic groups. Just by taking free products of groups, you can get anything as a subgroup of an acylindrically hyperbolic group. Um, so locally, you have very little control over what can be inside of these. But globally, um, you can say a lot about the overall structure, um, which is one of the things that I'm going to try to do today. Um, one thing I'll also add to this, which is what we'll uh, be talking about for the rest of the time, since the terms uh, small cancellation theory were in my, or small cancellation were in my title, these groups have lots of normal subgroups. So simple groups can't be acylindrically hyperbolic. And so we'll talk about um, how to find certain normal subgroups um, is what we'll do next. I mean, there, there are other examples. Um, so SLNZ, where n is at least three, um, can be on this list, but I'm not going to talk too much about why that is right now. All right, so now I want to get to um, some more interesting things that you can prove using this machinery, and it's specifically some, some kind of various versions of small cancellation theory that can be generalized into this context. Um, so the first one I want to mention um, is really um, due to uh, Damani, Girardel, and Osen. So they, uh, they developed this machinery um, uh, for what's called hyperbolically embedded subgroups which is going to give you actually another equivalent way to define the same class of groups. And the idea here is that they built a dictionary. So a, a lot of the work on hyperbolic groups has been generalized in various contexts to this relatively hyperbolic group setting. And Damani, Girardel, and Osen built a dictionary for how to translate proofs from this language to the language of hyperbolically embedded subgroups. So it doesn't always work. I mean, there are some restrictions you get here that you don't get over here. Um, but in general, a lot of things that you can do in the relatively hyperbolic world, you can also do in the acylindrically hyperbolic world um, using their machinery. So, so one version of this um, is what's called group theoretic Dane filling. Um, so I don't want to I think define a hyperbolically embedded subgroup since this is a little bit technical. But let me give you some examples, um, which are the ones I'm going to apply this theorem to. So if G is, say our group G has this acylindrical action on a hyperbolic space, um, and G in here is loxodromic, then um, subgroup generated by G is not itself hyperbolically embedded, but it is up to finite index. So this is finite index in some subgroup E, which is uh, hyperbolically embedded in G. Right? And, and I can also find, um, I'll say that there exists so this is true for any loxodromic element. There's some loxodromic elements, say x and y, such that the subgroup generated by these two, again, up to finite index, is hyperbolically embedded. So. Uh, their theorem, which is, is built on kind of a geometric version of small cancellation theory. So this is Damani, Girardel, and Osen. Um, so it's a, 
kind of a technical statement, but I'll mention some, some nice results that you get from it. So if H is hyperbolically embedded in G, um, and N is a normal subgroup of H, uh, which avoids some fixed finite set of elements. Then what you have is that if I take the n and I look at the um, normal closure of that in G, Right. First of all, the canonical quotient of h by n is going to embed into that quotient. Uh, second is that that group itself, the normal closure of n, this is uh, going to be equal to uh, an infinite free product of conjugates of n. And finally, elements in here, maybe I'll use H, are either uh, loxodromic or conjugate to N. So the applications of this theorem that I want to mention is first, if I apply this to the group E and I look at conditions B and C, um, what I get is that for any loxodromic element G, I can take some high power to avoid this finite set and look at its normal closure in the group G. And this is an infinite, uh, this is an infinite rank free group. And this is purely loxodromic. Meaning every, yeah, every element of this acts as a loxodromic isometry on X. But don't you want to make some statements here about how this portion is X or something? So yeah, so it's also going to be true that uh, actually this quotient is hyperbolically embedded in here. So again, you can get an action of this on a, on a acylindric. This quotient is again itself going to be acylindrically hyperbolic. Right. So this is true. Uh, um, okay. Yes. So there's a few different versions of this. I'm sort of stating the simplest one uh, to allow me to mention some consequences that I think are interesting. Um, so for example, uh, if you look at, at some of these, I guess I should mention here, um, so for hyperbolic groups, the loxodromic elements for this are just all infinite order elements. Right? For relatively hyperbolic groups, it's going to be any element that's not uh, conjugate into the parabolic subgroup any infinite or element that's not conjugate into the parabolic subgroup. For mapping class groups, these are the pseudo-anosif elements. Uh, and for out FN, these are going to be the, the fully irreducible automorphisms. So what this says is that, say, uh, in particular in the case of mapping class groups and outer automorphism groups, you have a free normal subgroup of only pseudo-anosif elements in the mapping class group. Or in out FN, you have a free normal subgroup of only fully irreducible elements. Um, in particular, you have free normal subgroups, so these are going to be simple. Um, and then um, applying this in the second case to this virtually free group, um, it's well known that, uh, or this was, a, I guess, a classic result of, I think, Higman, Neumann, and Neumann, that every countable group embeds into some two-generated group. Right, which means that every countable group is going to embed into some quotient of this. And in particular, then that quotient is going to embed uh, into some quotient of G. So what this says is that um, uh, so this is again Dwani Gerard L. Nosen, is that acylindrically hyperbolic groups are SQ universal. So in particular, every 
countable group is going to embed into some quotient of G. Um, so this is a kind of a, a algebraic version of, of largeness. These groups are very big. They have lots and lots of quotients. Um, in particular, from this you can derive that G has uncountably many normal subgroups, right? Uh, because there's only uh, countably many finitely generated subgroups of any um, finitely generated group. So actually that's a, a way I can add uh, SLN Z here for N at least three, because the Margulis normal subgroup theorem says these only have countably many normal subgroups. So that's one of the ways that you can see this. All right, so, th so this theorem gives you a way to build sort of lots of normal subgroups that have uh, interesting dynamics and then also um, lots and lots of quotients of these groups. All right, so what I want to talk about next uh, is another version of, of small cancellation theory. Um, so this is kind of built on sort of a geometric version of small cancellation theory. It's another sort of more combinatorial version was first suggested by Gromov and developed by a few people. And then we'll try to give some interesting consequences of this theorem until we run out of time. So uh, this theorem was uh, originally, um, I guess, stated by Gromov, although he stated it slightly incorrectly and didn't really prove it completely. Um, so the correct statement and proof is actually due to Olshansky. Okay, so theorem is let G be a hyperbolic group, I guess non-elementary hyperbolic group. Um, and let H be a non-elementary subgroup. And uh, assume that H does not, so this was the technical addition that Gromov forgot, which is actually essential. H does not normalize any finite subgroups. of G, um, then uh, there exists a quotient, um, say a quotient map, so a surjective homomorphism from G to G bar, um, which satisfies, one is that G bar itself is hyperbolic. Um, two is that the map restricted to H is surjective. All right, so H is, is mapping onto the quotient. Um, I should have also said I need to fix um, some finite subset of G. Okay, so I can ensure that, so uh, a priori right now with just one and two, this might be the trivial group. So I want some condition to say that this is not the trivial group. So I can make this map injective on whatever finite set of elements I want. So in particular, I can guarantee that this group is not abelian by making it injective on G, H, and the commutator of G and H. Um, and then, Four, um, I don't add new torsion. So I'll just say no new torsion. So the technical statement is that any element of G bar of finite order is the image of an element of G of finite order. All right. So this theorem uh, perhaps looks a little technical, but it, it allows you to simplify a lot of sort of complicated small cancellation theory constructions. Um, to build sort of exotic groups very easily. So for example, you can inductively apply this theorem to build a group with all proper subgroups infinite cyclic. 
starting with any torsion-free hyperbolic group. You just uh, keep making it take any two elements which are not part of the same cyclic subgroup and make the quotient injective on that pair, right? And just keep repeating this over pairs of elements till in the, in the limit, either two elements generate an infinite cyclic subgroup or the whole group, right? Um, you can also get infinite property T quotients of hyperbolic groups um, and other things with this. Um, now, if I add here, uh, this theorem was extended to uh, relatively hyperbolic groups. Um, I don't actually need finitely generated here, but I'm going to add it to make statements consistent. With slight modifications, I can just put countable here. But by Osen, proved the same theorem for finitely generated relatively hyperbolic groups. Um, and in doing so, he used this to build the first example of a finitely generated group in which all non-trivial elements are conjugate. Uh, I should say an infinite group, because the group with two elements satisfies that. But he built the first finitely generated group with more than two elements uh, that satisfied that condition. <laughs> um, and then the same theorem, again, if I had finitely generated, I can keep the same statement applies for acylindrically hyperbolic groups, uh, and that's due to me. Um, and uh, this is really built out of sort of combining Osen's proof for relative hyperbolic groups and then the Damani Girardel machinery. And the conclusion is still the same as the quotient is actually Ah, sorry, no, this is uh, relatively hyperbolic for Osen's version and then acylindrically hyperbolic for my version, sorry, yes. Um, and these can be modified, so I can remove finitely generate and put countable, but I have to modify two a little bit. And in both OSIN and my version, this can be injective on actually slightly bigger than finite sets. So in OSIN's version, it's a ball in the relative Cayley graph, so it's injective on the parabolic subgroups. Um, and in, in my version, it's something similar to that. <laughs> so let's try to see how to get some nice consequences of this. in eight minutes. So uh, first I'll just say this one without, do, without proving it, um, but using exactly uh, Gromov's technique, uh, one corollary of this is uh, every acylindrically hyperbolic group has an infinite uh, property T quotient. All right, so this, this corollary is about three lines modulo this theorem. So this is very easy to do. Um, but instead of doing that, I want to mention this other corollary because uh, I think I can actually prove this and it's fairly nice. So let me actually include it as part of this. So I don't have to, again, write every acylindric hyperbolic group. And an infinite quotient. Uh, maybe I do have to write it again, because I want. So every torsion-free um, acylindric hyperbolic group. Really, I mean countable. And in my proof, I'll probably assume finally generated group has a quotient. with um, two conjugacy classes. So this uh, exotic group that Osen built, um, this version for acylindric hyperbolic groups, you can slightly simplify his construction, as well as get that you can start from any acylindric hyperbolic group and build this as a quotient. Um, so the idea here is that starting with G, if I just enumerate the elements, the trivial element is G0, and then after that, G1, G2, et cetera. Um, I can first embed G into an H and N extension. So this isn't G bar, where I take, say, G1 conjugated by T equals G2. Right? And in fact, this embedding, it's a little bit to check here, but it's going to satisfy this condition that I need to apply this theorem. 
So I can now map this onto a quotient um, where this map restricted to G is surjective. Yeah, so this is a quotient of the H and N extension, and the map on G is surjective. So I'm going to, I call this group G of 1. Right, and now I have a, a map from G to this G of 1, and in here, G1 is conjugate to G2, and then I can repeat this procedure at G of 2, where the first three elements are conjugate, and I can just do this inductively right, until I get a limit group. Right, and by this third condition, I can choose a finite set of elements that never uh, get mapped to the trivial element under here. So this will be now a non-trivial element. In fact, it'll, um, I can, if I want, make sure it contains free subgroups or um, other things. And every element at some point in the process became conjugate. So this is a group with two conjugate C classes. Um, so yeah, so this, this theorem sort of allows you to, to simplify these constructions quite a bit. Um, let me mention, I'm probably... Sorry, I didn't understand um, this last line. You, you, you built this one group yes. where the first two elements are conjugate, and then the second one where the, uh, the three of them all conjugate. So are you thinking like the limit, the first one? Limit? Yeah, uh, so, so what I think of is... Um, C is going to be G mod the union of the kernels of all of these maps, oh, right? So, the, so I have the map from G to G1, which has some kernel, and then G to G2 with some kernel, and then I think of the limit as I... No, no, but there's no new element, right? This is just a quotient of G. So I look at the image oh, of oh, right. I look at the image of G1 yeah. and G2. If they're already conjugate, I do nothing. If they're not, I do the H and extension and keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So the point is, from here to here, I'm not actually adding anything new, right? So in, in Osen's proof of this, you have to start with a parabolic subgroup where you already have all of non-trivial elements are conjugate. But that subgroup is not finitely generated, and somehow you have to build finite generation into the sequence because you can't add new conjugation in the parabolic subgroup. But in the acylindric hyperbolic case, it doesn't matter. You can just keep enumerate all the elements and make them conjugate one at a time. Um, so uh, there's some other corollaries where we can say some nice things about um, building other types of exotic quotients. Um, we can also use this theorem to prove some things about subgroups, um, which I'm not going to have time for. So let me, let me mention just one more result so I don't say uh, only talk about quotients. So another theorem, which is not quite a direct application of this, um, but it uses sort of the same small cancellation techniques. Um, and this is myself and Osen. So actually, Osen is going to talk about this um, and some, some interesting applications of this theorem, some interesting corollaries of it next week. But um, if G is acylindrically hyperbolic, um, and I guess countable, then G has a permutation representation. So by that I mean a homomorphism from G into the symmetric group on some countable set, say the natural numbers, uh, with finite kernel. So it's almost faithful and dense image. So thinking of the symmetric group of the natural numbers as a topological group with just pointwise convergence, um, you can get a permutation representation that has a dense image. So equivalently of an action on a countable set, and any k-tuple, there's some group element that takes this k-tuple to any other k-tuple that you want. 
Right, so this ends up having some, some interesting, uh, interesting corollaries. And the proof of this is really based on the same small cancellation theory we do use to prove this there. That bell, I guess, means I'm out of time. Thank you very much.